right. Well, welcome to what is this? Uh, Biotech Simplified Live. My second live today. <laughs> and I did the Heller the Heller Barnes uh, Ask Me Anything live earlier today. So I definitely hope that uh, you're doing well today. And this is episode number two of this podcast. And uh, we'll be doing this every Tuesday from now until the cows come home type thing. So I want to talk about a couple things today. Uh, raw, raw audio versus processed audio, uh, a new drive that uh, I, I'm i really happy about that this has come about. And I'll talk about external drives and iCloud and some things like that. Plus, take all your questions. So, hey, Crystal, thanks for joining us there. Really super helpful to see you. And uh, so if ever somebody can't hear something or can't see something, be sure to throw something in the chat. It's really helpful to know that you're there in the chat and it, it, you can see things, you can hear things, and uh, everything's working the way we expect. So first thing I'm going to talk about real quickly is just a new drive that came out over the last six months that I'm really happy about. And it's an upgrade drive for me in that I have been recommending, let's see, I didn't, I'm going to take this and there, uh, Samsung, Samsung, the T7, what is it, T7 uh, something, something, Shield, yeah, yeah, C can't spell it, I-E-L-D, -I Shield. The T7 Shield here, this thing, oh, that one's probably, the, that's that's really a, a great one there on Amazon. And um, this is a great drive, just a great drive. And um, and I've been using this for a couple of years, been recommending it for multiple years. And the reason is it's rugged. So if someone accidentally drops something, hey, wh why do we have a drive but, to, but have data and things that are important to us? And if it were to ever get dropped, portable drives do get dropped a little more than obviously more than anything else. Laptops get dropped. And this thing is even water resistant. If it fell out of your pocket and you were in a snowstorm or you're in the rain or whatever, then cool. It'll withstand that. Well, that's been my go-to recommendation for the last couple of years. This thing's just a great, great, great drive. I like Samsung for a couple of reasons. They make their own memory. They make their own controllers. And, and because of that combination, they do this great job. So therefore, I highly recommend them. I'm excited about them. Um, I use them and I and just have had very good luck with them. And so many people, I'll bet I have, uh, if I have less than 300 people from my recommendations, then I, I'd be surprised. But as, as what happens in life, all things, uh, the T7 is still available and it's still a great drive. But now we have the T9 that's been out for a little bit here. And this thing is pretty spectacular. The Now, it has crazy amounts of speed, you know, but you do get to a point of diminishing return. And this is one of the things that's going to happen over the next few years. For the, the how fast our audio is going to be written to disk, um, I don't know. In most cases, it's not going to make that big of a difference. But, hey, if you have too much speed, uh, it's great. And, of course, what seems like it's super fast today seems slow in a couple of years. Nonetheless, there's a brand new. So if you're buying now, if you're if you if you bought it, that one of these T7s, you're going to be in great shape for multiple years. But the T9 is where I will probably be recommending. And then if someone wants to save a few bucks, these T7s are still awesome. They are excellent, excellent quality drives. And even look at oh, this is interesting. Oh no, that's a one terabyte. I was going wow, that's even cheaper. They do go on sale right now. This is—I don't think that's even a sale price. They go down another thirty bucks, but the T9s are what I will be recommending uh, moving forward here as my go-to drive. I just—I'm—I'm—I tend to be loyal to companies that I've seen over often decades, uh, but it's certainly over because I've been messing with computers since uh, 1989. I got my first PC. I got my first Mac in 1991. So I've been on the Mac and the PC, both of them. And so I've used, I don't know, 30 drives, 40 drives over time. I had a rack at a data center when the internet was young. This would be about when, when Windows 95 came out. Um, I was actually, there was something called MSN. Anyway, there was, there, was, there was a bunch of stuff. I've been around messing with computers since the 90s. And so I've, I had a data center rack, which just meant I don't know, that thing had 20, 25 drives in it. So we were constantly replacing drives as we had RAID arrays, for those who know about all that cool stuff. And in that, you could pull out a drive in real time and pop in another one and repopulate, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't drop a beat. Everything would continue to work. So 
the drives that I recommend are among the most reliable out there. That's the most important thing to me. I'd like to save a few bucks if I can, but it's not worth it with your data and things that you have stored on there. Even though you have backups to backups, get a good quality drive, spend an extra 50 bucks, save up and get a great drive. It will save you so much hassle. I've had the unfortunate experience of having a drive fail. Uh, we're going back 15, 20 years and having to take it to a place that they pull all the data off it and they charge, I don't know, it's like 800 bucks, $1,000 back in the day to get all the data off of it. And they would take the drive. This was one of our physical drives. They'd take them out and put them in a new case and, and recover all the data. So having done that, I'm kind of a pain. I want really good quality drives. So if you're looking for a drive, these Samsung T9s are amazing. And they're the, I like the cases on them. They're going to stand up to being dropped. Don't do that. They're going to stand up to, to being dropped in water. Don't do that. Uh, that's more... <laughs> If you're dropping your drives in, dro in water, don't, don't, don't call me when they don't work, okay? Because I'm not, th these, these are designed to handle a drop and be in, I don't know, three to, three to six feet of water for 30 seconds without any problems. It's probably a lot more than that. There's some rating system on that. Don't do that, okay? Keep them out of the rain. Keep them out of the water. Don't throw them in things. But they're very well-made drives, and that's the most important thing. And they'll withstand a lot of abuse and still keep you going. And they're not that expensive. I cannot believe that an SSD is this much. And I should mention, I didn't even think of this one, Western Digital, um, that is a black hard drive. And if somebody has been around me a while, I've used these. And, and the reason I really like them, they have these five terabyte drives for 150 bucks. We, it, the, now, eight terabyte drive, for $189. And here's the weird thing about that. We would have killed for the speed that these things are getting for back when I had my servers running. We, did, we just didn't have drives that were this fast when we were on servers. Now, today, there's no big deal. And I do use these Western Digital. I still use these today in my computers where I have a, uh, I have a five terabyte and a four terabyte drive. And these things are so fast that even though I do have SSDs for my I have a couple of SSDs and I've got a couple of these. These are where everything goes after I, when I don't need it in near real time. But they're so fast, they could be my primary drives and, and you'd bear, you would notice a difference. There is a difference, but they're so cheap. I cannot believe that you could get, what is this here? Eight terabyte drive for under $200, okay? So if you need drives, get drives. If, you have a, if, you're, if, you're, if you're on a laptop, then you're stuck with external drives, do the Samsungs. If you have a desktop, which I've been recommending for years, you can also get these things without their little cases. They're even cheaper, and they're fantastic drives, okay? I highly... Now, nothing's perfect. Uh, you can get great tires, and you still can get a flat. So don't, don't, do not assume that uh, everything is, is just because you have a great tire doesn't mean it can't fail. Just because you buy a great refrigerator doesn't mean it can't fail at some odd point. And in terms of drives, you have the same thing. That, uh, that, that they do fail at now. They're more and more reliable every year. They're better and better than they've ever been. They're pretty amazing as, in terms of the total life that they're getting out of, but nothing in a drive you should assume is gonna fail. Just if you, if you assume it's going to fail, not if it's gonna fail, assume it's going to fail, you'll be, you'll be in the right spot for that. All right, I'm gonna look at a couple questions here before we talk about some other things and see what's come up here and we have Crystal. Let's ask a question. You mentioned the cloud. Oh yeah, hot swapability is a blessing back then. Hot swapability, man, it, absolutely. You can still do that today, by the way. Um, there's a network attached store, network attached storage. A new tongue twister that I should add to my list. Network attached st attached storage. <laughs> Easy for you to say. There's there's all sorts of things today. You still can hot swap drives if you have the right configuration. You have to have the right enclosures and all. But that's way beyond what most voiceover people need. But hey, if you're if you know about them, then you can you should ha you know you can have those. I had rate arrays for things. Uh, what is it? Five level five. I don't remember what the term was, but it was a they had a numbering system from one to five. But the bottom line is you could have you you'd have a set of drives and one failed. The way the data was being written across three to five drives, any one of those drives could fail in real time, 
and you could pop in another drive and it would recreate everything and it would, no one would ever know that a drive had failed. You know, if you lost two drives, then life was not too good. But that's how that worked there. So hot swappability was absolutely amazing. So hey, Red Apple, Crystal, Stephen, Paul. Uh, uh, so you mentioned the cloud. How challenging it is to remove material already in the cloud and put it on a portable hard drive? Oh, that's actually easy. It just takes some time. When you're, all you have to do is you can go into the browser, you can go to your cloud drive, and you can go in and you can highlight it. You'd be in the Finder. Excuse me, there is a web interface as well. But let's say you're on the Mac. You have iCloud. And uh, you can go into there and you can copy. One of the one of my rules for doing for getting data off of the cloud is always copy first, paste into your local drive, and don't del and then rename the master folder that that was in so that if some if some app was trying to go and get it you would know it it would tell you hey I can't find it and then you could redirect it to the new location, but I never do a move so there's a difference between a move between drives and a copy. If I do a move. So let's back this up. If you move, use the move command to move something between two drives, then that is going to be deleted on the original location. Your, your goal is you want to copy and then do a paste into a new location. And then you keep the original one there for a month or three. And then you go ahead and archive it or delete it. Depends on the nature of the data. I first usually rename the master folder so that if anything was going and looking at it, it would throw an error and alert me that somehow I haven't reconfigured everything to look in the new location. A couple of baby steps, it's easy to do, but it can take some time depending on how much data you have stored in the cloud. It's not that hard, but you do have to be meticulous about this stuff where you're doing copies as opposed to moves, and you just have to make sure that you're aware of which one you're doing. By default, iCloud will do copies, uh, but don't ever assume that. Just make sure you're copying, and if you're not sure, hey, get some help on that because uh, the last thing you want to do is destroy all the data that's there. But normally you copy it and then it's still on the iCloud because I've done a copy. And then later I'll go back and clean up that and get rid of that stuff over time. I just don't do it instantly. Don't do it all in one day. Do not, don't move it, don't copy it, and then delete it in the other drive immediately. Leave it for a couple of weeks at least. And then when you're sure, cool, then you can move on to the next one. All right. Uh, so if there's any other questions on that, be sure to post those there. Okay. And oh, one thing, I got to see if there's any comments over here. And uh, I'm going to refresh a little window that I have that's supposed to show me stuff, but I don't see any comments there. So hey, we'll just assume there are none. Okay. That doesn't make sense to me. But um, oh, there's one. I got one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So next thing I want to talk about here. Oh, look at that. Um, yeah, now that I've got that, that's working too. <laughs> so the replay, by the way, I, I, I appreciate everybody that's over on, on uh, YouTube watching this live. Super helpful building that. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. We're doing this every week. By the way, 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock Eastern. No, 2 o'clock, I get the times all mixed up. 5 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock Pacific, okay? I'm going to learn my time zones here too, all right? Next thing we're going to talk about. So some people always said there's, uh, wanted to talk about raw versus processed audio. That came up in the group here this last week, and I thought, yeah, that's a good topic because it's confusing. First thing, uh, if somebody, if if I were doing a theater show, there they could say I've heard this term before. Well, they'll tell you to come in raw because the the makeup artists are going to do the makeup, and then a lot of the uh, I went and saw Cirque du Soleil. I actually know somebody in one of the shows. She does all her own makeup. She does. They, they no longer have a. I don't know why. I don't know, but maybe because the show's run for multiple years and they didn't want to pay somebody for multiple years to do makeup. But she's a principal in one of the Cirque du Soleil shows and she does her own makeup. Okay. I mean, I don't know the details about it. She just said, Yeah, we, always do, we do our own makeup. I have to do all my own makeup. So, okay. So she does not come in raw for that. If, if, if somebody's told me if I were doing a show and they said, Oh, come in raw, I'm not going in with no clothes. That's not what they mean. They mean don't do my hair, don't do my makeup. Maybe I didn't do my hair today, but so what they really want is they want me like I I just look better in a shirt, okay? That's how I'm gonna stay. That's that's I'm I'm gonna leave it right there with that. Clothes make the man, as they say, and uh, I'm not going in raw. Well, here's the funny thing about audio. You will hear 
people ask for raw audio. My blue track there is my original recording, and I even label that raw. I could have called that original. I could whatever. I always have a raw copy of my audio around. I just do, don't get rid of audio. I keep the raw copy around. Now, here's the funny thing, though. Your client asks for raw. Your client asks for processed. And then there's really an in-between zone that no one wants to talk about. So I'll talk about it, and I'll take the grief. But basically, engineers don't want you to... If, if you were going into a makeup artist, if you're going into somebody that's doing your hair, what they don't want is me to put on all my uh, normal makeup stuff, my clown stuff, before I get to the makeup artist. Because what they would want to do is they go, oh, you messed that up because I don't know what I'm doing. And they would, they would take it all off and then they would redo it. Well, that's extra work for them. So if, they, if I have a pro makeup artist doing my makeup, then they are going to just do it. I don't know what I'm doing. That's, that's an obvious thing. <laughs> I'd look a lot better if I knew what I was doing with makeup. I have zero clue. Um, but they want me to have just washed my face after a shower and left it that way, and then they're going to do it if I were doing a stage thing, if, I'm, if I was doing a TV thing, whatever. That's what they're going to do. And they really don't want me to come in and say, well, you know what? I decided that I would put on the foundation. And they're like, well, you have a cheapo foundation. We have good foundation. I don't know, assuming foundations come at different stages there. But whatever they put on as the base coat of paint for me, they're going to prime it. They're going to give me a, a professional quality primer. And I at home have, you know, whatever I get down at Target or at Walmart or something. I mean, it's not, I don't know, I get whatever is on sale. So, and then they have to deal with 20 different things. They, they if they're going to do my makeup, they already know what they want for all the different layers. And they're probably going to use brands that work together. I know nothing about that. And that's kind of how it happens here. Audio engineers and clients very often say, send me raw. But here's the little dirty secret out there in the business. I can't tell you how many people I know that have done 300 or more audiobooks, for example, and those audiobooks have all the actual narrator ran a mouthy clicker before they ever sent in their audio. Now, I, so, and that's just rampant anymore. Why? Because they used to assume that the audio engineers at the major publishers were going to run a mouthy click on their end. But what's happened is they don't have time anymore. There's too many books coming in and too short of a period of time, and they're not going to micro. And they be, they're, they're, the spirit of what they go through is this: the acquisition editor and the author like this narrator, like you. And then if you have a little bit of mouth noise, they go, "Well, yeah, but they liked them. Good enough." And sometimes they're under time pressure. And if they don't think, you now if you're a Johnny Heller or a Joanne Perrin, you, you, she, those people. They may go ahead and take some more care with a Heller book because he's famous. He's been around for a while. He's, he's done so much that he's going to have his own audience in addition to the author having their own audience. And so, so that's a different world where, yes, they may take a little more care with his than they would with something like me. They go, ah, Barnes book's going to sell three copies. Or, if it, by the way, if you're working for a major, they're assuming the book is going to sell 10,000 copies or something. They have some target number that anything below that, they'd feel like a loser and should never have been produced. But it's going to sell 5,000. But that's different than one of the major people that's a star who's recording a major book where they're going to sell hundreds of thousands. Yeah, those people are going to get mouthy clicked and all the details taken care of. If you've done less than 500 books, they don't have time to mess with my stuff. First off, they're going to sign me books that they are that are important to them, but they don't expect them to sell 500,000 copies of something that I did. They know, hey, uh, we assigned this book to Don because it's going to sell 100 copies, 1,000 copies, something, 10,000 copies even. And in their world, that's not a lot. So they want it to be good. They, they expect me to have done a great job, but you can mouth the click because it's totally transparent. And if you can't set it up, cool. Talk to me. I can set that up for you. So can a lot of other people. That tool is amazing in what it can do, and nobody can tell when it's used right if it's ever been done and it just takes out some mouth noise, okay? When it's used right, you don't have to worry about it. It's 100% transparent. It's crazy how good that is. Now, the, the where it gets into a gray area is you do, first off, you can almost always do a high pass. High pass, I wouldn't have this one on. I would have this off. But you can do a high pass and take off anything in the lower level there. 
and uh, and nobody cares. That's just the low end. That's below our voice. Who cares? Be gone. It's just noise. You can. That's the one thing you can get rid of, and it'll still be called raw. Then you have this gray area, and uh, don't do this unless you know what you're doing. But this, uh, I'm showing here something that has some noise in it. Um, it's not a lot if I measure it. We can go over here and measure and get some stats on that. Minus 78. It's unhearable by the not by 90% of the people out there. But here's the thing that happens. I have a couple major clients that are that you would know their name probably if you're in the if you're in if depending on what your what business. I have both voice voiceover and they have narrators. People who are absolute brand names in both of those genres or areas or whatever. And we have a denoiser running in their case. Why? Hey, they've been working with some of these clients for a, a decade, and then they move. And when they move, their new spot is not at the same level as their old spot. And, you know, sometimes, I, I don't know, have if, if you ever moved? <laughs> it can be really amazing. When you move, um, there you can't sometimes get everything done all at once. And sometimes the rooms they're in, based on the location they're in, it might take them six months to have the room totally built out to meet the old standards. And there are some new locations that will never be exactly the same as the old location. So what do we do? There are a couple of cases where I have denoisers running and uh, it's going in as raw. But you have to be very careful about what you're doing with that. First off, if you do it, don't you dare say, well, Barnes told me I could do that. No, I didn't. These people did not do it themselves. I did set it up for them. I've taken responsibility for it. I can transparently take out some stuff. If you have the right tools and you have the experience, then you can do other things. And I do have major clients that are going and both publishers and then voiceover situations where they are submitting what should be or what they're calling raw, but it has a denoiser running. It has mouthy clickers running on it simply because if done really well, nobody can tell. Okay. Now uh, you gotta be, but if you do that, you run the risk of pissing off your client and having them never work with you again because they've told you raw. In a couple of cases, yeah, it can be done. So just be real careful about that. But boy, uh, mouth to click, uh, you can do that all day long and should, and everything that goes in, I I do that. I don't care if they say raw, fully produced. And fully produced means we're meeting some sort of specs. We're gonna have compressors. I have some tools that I'm running on most things. I could be running an expander, depends on the room. I'm always going to be running a, a high pass. I'm going to run a compressor. I might run a DSer, certainly running a limiter. Uh, I might have a tool. So there's a set of tools that are happening in the background. And when, when the, they are applied, I can get fully mastered audio without having to do anything. So there's a bunch of things to have mastered audio. You are going to apply some tools. And what you end up with is, I'll make these two the same height here. Uh, blue track was raw recordings, and you can see it's a little spikier here. And yellow track here. Oh, I think I just duplicated this one. I did this one. I didn't export it. Well, I'll do that. Shoot. We'll do this because that would make more sense. Let's export this other track. And I really should have. I think I was doing a demo with something, and I just duplicated the track. So you notice that they both. Let's make sure we got this right. Both these tracks look the same. That's because both these tracks are the same. I was doing a demo for somebody and showed off something, and I just copied a track to simulate uh, that, it, that it had been mastered and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't actually do it. Okay, so now live, what I'm going to do, I think I'll cancel that for a second. Let me unmute this because I wasn't doing it. I'm going to get rid of this one. So now live, uh, raw. Then I'm going to take this raw, and I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to master it. And when I master it, there it is right there. And I'll set that in here. And what did I do? Oh, I had that one muted. And I took this one and I did that wrong. See, look at that. When you're live, that's what happens. Let's do that one more time and get it right. That's right. <laughs> it cracks me up. So, you know, I've done this 4,000 times and I still got it wrong. There we go. It had a weird name to me. There we go. That's right. All right. Phew. Thought I'd lost the touch there, but I got it. I recovered. All right. So, no. This audio is raw looking, okay? Check that out. That's definitely raw. This audio has been mastered. Now, it's subtle between these two samples, and that's the right thing. The world should not know that your audio has been mastered. Matter of fact, I have this thing. I want you to sound natural. I don't want you to sound raw. 
and, and there, there is a difference, that you want to sound normal, natural, comfortable, easy to listen to. No, but that doesn't mean raw, raw. And raw isn't always better. Uh, raw eggs, who wants to eat raw eggs? I mean, maybe I do, maybe I don't, maybe I'm doing special diet, that's fine. But 90% of us want our eggs cooked because they're better and they're also easier to digest in some ways. You cook food, I don't want raw bread dough either. I want baked bread. Uh, baking changes it just slightly and makes it palatable. Uh, we just all eat bread dough if that were the wonderful thing. And I don't even know if it's good for you, bad for you. I don't even care. That's a different discussion. But when you, your audio, it is not a major difference when it is well mastered. It is a subtle difference. And you can tell a difference, but it is subtle. And here it is visually. And you can see the difference where, hey, the compressor kicked in and the limiters kicked in and that's a starting point. So this is what mastered audio looks like and I'd have to play it for you and you'd have to be on a good playback system and you can hear a difference. I haven't run this one through RX yet and I would normally run that through RX before I put it in this track and I'd let it take out the couple things that bother me. I can see them from a mile away here. The thing is, is that this is what is going to go through to, the client, uh, to a client that wants raw I may, after I do a D-click, this is what it's going to look like when it's mastered. And this one is going to be much more comfortable for listeners at the end of the day to listen to and enjoy compared to this one. This is easier and better and something that people will go, I don't know. I don't know why it sounds different, but I like this one better. And, I've, and there are some very good reasons for that. And we'll talk about that uh, another day, another time. And I'm going to check. Let me check for questions and comments over here. Uh, let's see. So Ben says, I've always considered raw for 99% of the deliveries, uh, being a high pass and D clicker, maybe, uh, some surgical more, uh, some surgical noise removal to keep things professional thoughts. Yeah, that works. The issue though with, uh, so basically I, so I buy into that. Yeah. And if you, as long as you have the skills, for example, if I had RX here, um, and let me go to the beginning cause there's almost all, ah, see, look at this right here. There's something over here at the very, very beginning. And let me zoom in on that so that you can you, you can see that right there. Yep, there that is there. Uh, a lower left-hand corner right down here. Well, it, it, first off, I would have normally just trimmed this off like this. So it would be totally gone so no one would see it. That's what I would have done there. Also, I don't like in the very beginning to have any noise. So I will almost always at the very beginning, no matter what they've told me to send them, I will end up doing this. I'm going to have instant process turned on, and I'm just going to do that. Now it fades in gracefully. That's a half a second of audio. I will go ahead and do that to the very beginning. I also do it at the end because, look, at this is this is after it's done, and there was I was sitting there and made some noise or something. I always get rid of that last little bit as well. So begins and ends, yeah, you can do a couple special things there. Nobody cares. Um, now, if there's something, by the way, there's some sibilance. You'll see this. I see dead people. I do. Uh, if you do this enough, you can see all sorts of details with a piece of audio. And uh, this was something that someone else sent me. This isn't the same one that I was showing in uh, in the DAW there a second ago. But see, here's something that sur surgically I removed with uh, instant process right there. You can see it visually. So here's the interesting thing. I'm zoomed in on that. Nobody would hear that in the real world. It's a little wider than I want. I think I was talking on the on, on a Zoom call with someone when I did it. I wonder if I could back it all the way out. If I oh there it is. Okay. So if I do this and surgically go through, no, depending on how much I do. Now note, I just did that with RX, where I even made my sliver smaller than the actual noise because I just wanted to take that out manually. And I don't want to take out very much. And that's something that nobody would hear. It's so short. It would go by without them noticing. And by the way, I wouldn't really be doing that because this one had has had uh, no, uh, it, I would have to put back. First off, I had to start at the beginning, take off, every, do all my man, automated processes, and then go ahead and uh, see what it's like after that. And in this case, if I take this out, I have to be really careful because, see, I, that can be visual, visible to another engineer. And that's the only thing about it. Now, no, 
uh, you can do some things with RX. Like I'm not going to highlight the whole thing, and I still can get almost all of it gone. And I could be more surgical right here, and then now that's gone. And that's enough that no one would notice that it was ever there. So note that if I if I were to highlight the whole thing, so this is kind of a we're not talking RX. But if I highlight the whole thing, it will make a much bigger. Um, let me zoom in on that so you can see that. I'm going to undo that, and then I'm going to zoom in on it. And then now I'm going to run that. I have a keyboard shortcut that I can do for that. And um, yep, there it is right there. That's the equivalent of running an instant process. Because I, I'm going to undo that. So you notice how wide that is right there. But what I could do instead, have instant process on, and then just get a part of it. So I'm now highlighting only half of it. And then you'll see that that makes it a lot less obvious then I could do a quarter of it, and I probably would be even better, right? Let me do a quarter of it here. Just get a little bit of it. Nah, it works even better, okay? So sometimes, but to be honest with you, if I saw this, I would know that you've messed with it. Now, sometimes, there's this weird thing. If you do a better job, if you do a good job with it, I'm not going to go, oh, man, Ben, you terrible person, you. You sent me something that had something fixed. It's kind of like I see it as long as it was done well. I'm like, oh, cool. Save me the hassle of doing it. I could be a rear end, though, and say, hey, I told you not to touch anything. Uh, but I don't. And so you, you can get one of those engineers that just goes, well, you touch something. And I'm thinking, in, in my world, if you make it better, I'm good with it. But I don't represent every engineer out there. And so you can have some people that say, hey, I told you not to do anything. You did something. Uh, you're a terrible person. And I don't really, you know, I don't think like that. I just think that if you made it better without destroying anything related to the voice, then I'm okay with it. So you go in here and start destroying something. That's a different thing. This here, we're going to have a discussion. You're out here and fixing things and saving me time and highlighting something and making that I don't really give a rip. I think that's a win for me. But I, you know, you do get into this whole little gray area where, yeah, if you do too much, people will notice, and then they'll say, "Hey, I told you not to do any of that stuff." So, and you did it. Are you listening to me? Then it's a whole different discussion. Okay. So your accent, so all this type. Oh, is it? okay. Mount the click these DSers. So Stephen, yes. Uh, Noel, the DSer that I there is a really good DSer in uh, RX. Yes, there is. Um, but it's hard to set. This is a great, this is actually an amazing tool here that most people just don't understand how good this is, how strong it is. Um, oh, let me get that on the screen a little better here. So, yeah, there it is. That's, that's the DSer that's in RX. That is a, that is a world-class DSer there that most people will not understand no matter what they do. But it's a, it's a really good tool. It's a harder tool to, to uh, tune though the first time because just even the guy who wrote it, I, he complained to me one time that he was not thrilled with the, the interface. He would do a couple things differently, but hey, he wrote all the code to make it work. He's the same guy that wrote the multi clicker and the denoisers and stuff. And he just thought that this could be a there could be a better representation of how to set it. So in my case, uh, if I need a DSer, 90% of the time I'm sitting over here and I prefer the DSer that's here because it's it'll it does a killer job but it's easier to set they did some really clever things here with the way this works to make life easy for us and so if somebody's using studio one they can use the one that's, that's built in with the at least the 79 dollar studio one version that's just a one of one of the tools that's available there really really great quality tool and it's included and you can also do it in rx if you don't have studio one that's cool there's a great DSer. But you do have to, this one uh, takes a lot more effort to get tuned in, a ton more effort. And uh, so I see a lot of people that are doing this. There's too, there's enough options that they kind of get themselves into trouble and do some things that aren't ideal. Okay? So that's, uh, so that's where it is. And by the way, a DSer, is that transparent? If you set it right, it can be very, very transparent with these tools. Uh, so if you really know what you're doing, that's another one that you can get away with doing, but you better know what you're doing because these tools will leave a mark in the audio if you overuse them 
if you underuse them, eh, no problem. But if you're going to use them, use them less than what you think they should be, and life is pretty good. So yeah, I do have some clients that they're not happy with their S's, and they notice after their book comes out from a major publisher that it uh, still has those S's because those engineers did not take that out. And we can set it up to where when you have the better tools, you can do this in many tools, you, you can apply a de-esser that's pretty transparent. And if you apply them right, they're absolute, absolutely transparent. Nobody will be able to tell because they only affect such a tiny part of the spectrum, okay? So there's Steven, I hope that answers your question there and um, hope that's helpful, okay? So raw audio, uh, you can go from 100% raw, uh, which is fine, does work in many cases. If you have the right room, your room should be set up to where your goal is that you could send in 100% unprocessed audio and your room is so strong and your setup is so strong that you don't have to do anything to it. Now that will never deal with mouth noise and mouth noise is a whole nother matter. And the issue with mouth noise that is that no one will talk about is that some days, some people have no mouth noise and they're very prideful of that. I don't have mouth noise, except for when I listen to 10 hours of the stuff that they do, some days they do have no mouth noise. And I used to kind of laugh. I'd think, oh, this guy must have gone out and partied the night before. He had a birthday party that he went to, or he had a Christmas party that he went to, or he didn't get a lot of sleep or whatever. I don't know his backstory and why, they, why. But, they, but he would start the book and I'd get in five chapters and then there'd be a lot of mouth noise on chapter seven. And after a while I learned, hey, even people that have lots of mouth noise, sometimes they'll have files that don't have a lot of mouth noise. What you sleep, how you slept, eating, how stressed you are, are you under a deadline? Just like you can hear somebody smiling in a voiceover, I can hear and I can tell when people are stressed because they end up with more mouth noise in most cases. And then I have some narrators that at the start of a chapter, their mouth noise is minimal and they get more. I have more people that have, they start with uh, lots of mouth noise and as they go further in, it diminishes, which is always bizarre but it means that their mouth is readjusting from whatever they ate before they came in. However stressed they were, they relax, they get into their groove if they've been doing this a while. And as they relax and get into it, then their mouth noise gets lower. And if they never get relaxed, some of them have very high mouth noise on, and then other days they have no mouth noise. So it is really funny where every once in a while somebody says, well, I don't have any mouth noise. And I, I never say anything, that's cool, I get it. But what they, what they don't realize is, yes, you probably don't have mouth noise or uh, some days because you ate red apples, but, that, but those wear off in a chapter. Uh, if they're doing green apples, sometimes the beginning of the chapter is one level and the end's another. If it's a 40-minute chapter, if it's 10 minutes, eh, they get away with it. Uh, so there's just a lot of factors in that. All right, so that's enough of that mouth click stuff. So raw audio, produced audio, it doesn't look that much different but it is a little different. This one would pass ACX specs. This one would not. Uh, this one will see, be a lot more comfortable for listeners to listen to. And one of the day, we'll have a discussion on compressors one day because compression is one of those things that people don't understand too often. And when they do understand it, uh, I, I'll, I'll just give you uh, the Cliff Notes version of it. You should have a good quality compressor running on all your, if you're going to have finished audio. If you're going to have great audio, a compressor helps your audience hear more and hear you more comfortably. And it's a tool that's been around for decades and there's good reasons it's around. And don't let anybody tell you that, oh, I just record natural. It's like, yeah, I could be natural too with no clothes on. Nobody want, nobody, ain't nobody want, got time for that. They don't want to see it. So it's not, can I? Sure, of course, you know. Um, but that's not always what they want when they want raw, but raw, Minimal processing, fully produced, is going to have a, a lot more done to it. But when it's done right, nobody will be going, wow, that voice sounds processed. It really should just be like, I don't know, it just sounds right. That's all it should sound. It should sound natural. It should sound right. It should not sound processed. The minute it sounds processed, we have way overdone something. So it shouldn't sound like we've done anything. I want them to just go, wow, that's... You know, that's the way crystal sounds. It's just comfortable, gentle, wonderful, soothing. You know, if Paul's recording something, it just sounds good. 
It doesn't sound processed. It doesn't sound compressed. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear the pumping of a compressor that you could do if you were recording music. One time somebody said to me something like, well, I don't compress because I don't want anybody to hear the pumping. And I kind of shook my head and thought, wait a minute. If you can hear pumping in your compressor on a voice track, you are doing something totally wrong. But that's a different discussion for a different day. So let me look at any other questions, comments here. And uh, oh, there's still a couple more of that. All right, good. I got. I think I got most of them there. All right. So if you have another question, comment, something that you want me to cover in these sessions, I'm doing this every Tuesday at 2, let's see, 2 o'clock Pacific. So that's 5 o'clock Eastern. I did that math in my head. And uh, be sure to watch the Heller Barn Show. Go to VOJumpstart.com if you're interested in Studio One and RX and completely done mastering stacks, then check out the RX course. RX, I've got that down to a science. You can get that at VOJumpstart.com. Great conversational course, great audition course. Lots of good stuff there. So check out VOJumpstart.com. And I think that's going to end it here for today. But I'll be back next Tuesday. So I'm on twice every Tuesday. So join join both the shows. And I look forward to seeing you on the wires. Be sure to join VO Jumpstart. Simpli no, VO Tech Simplified uh, in the Facebook group. Okay, that's been sitting here at the bottom of your screen. So you could see that all day long. I think it's down here someplace. And, uh, you know, join that group if you're not in that group already. Hope you have a fantastic one. We'll talk to you later. Bye.